Point of order, the Honourable Jerry Brownlee. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, subsequent to discussions at the Business Committee, I seek leave for the sitting of the House today to be extended to, um, uh, through tomorrow morning from 9am to 1pm uh, for the second reading of the Nauru Hini Claim Settlement Bill and the remaining stages of the Hini Uru Claim Settlement Bill. Leave is sought for that purpose. Is there any objection? There is no objection. Thank you. Uh, um, Dr David Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I look forward to uh, the opportunity to speak. I have been looking forward to the opportunity to speak on this bill, uh, particularly after the contribution of the last member, uh, who I think illustrated um, a point I wanted to make in my speech, which is that there is no plan for this government. And these supplementary estimates, which we're debating today, uh, make that abundantly clear. The supplementary estimates uh, for people at home uh, come out in a volume like this. You can get them on a computer uh, as well. They're a pretty solid uh, book, uh, usually in a blue cover, produced by the Treasury and indicating the areas in which government has moved money around in the year that has passed. And they do it um, to make sure that there is appropriate accounting treatment uh, for the money that has been spent. But that previous member uh, would have us believe a whole lot of bunkum if we took his speech at face value. He didn't speak at all about the supplementary estimates. I, I propose to differ from his approach, Mr Speaker, and actually speak a little to the supplementary estimates in my speech, novel though that may seem in such a debate. Uh, but I also just want to set the record straight on a couple of things that he raised. The first thing uh, he said was that the Cullen government uh, was not a good manager of the economy, or words to similar effect. That government ran nine surpluses in a row. Now, I can't claim any credit for that. I wasn't a minister in that government. I wasn't even a member of parliament uh, when the last Labor government was here. Uh, but what I can say is that I've done the sums myself, and look, they grew the economy 25% real. Once you strip out inflation and all of that kind of stuff, 25% real. They genuinely grew the economy. This government, and they did nine surpluses out of nine budgets, ran nine surpluses in a row. I think the facts speak for themselves. This government, by contrast, has borrowed more money than Robert Muldoon's government borrowed. They have generated deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit. And finally, they've squeaked a couple of surpluses home through a bit of jiggery-pokery. And that, Mr Speaker, is the economic record that we are debating here today. All those fine words that that member uh, read out to the House do not address those fundamental facts, those fundamental facts of history. The last Labor government grew the economy. This government has struggled to make ends meet. And part of the problem, Mr Speaker, I would argue, is laid bare in these uh, supplementary estimates. There is no plan. There is no dream of sharing the economy uh, amongst the members of our citizenry. They are not interested in sharing any economic gains uh, with New Zealanders, with middle New Zealand. Most New Zealanders are missing out. Under the last Labor government, uh, over 50 per cent of the gains went to ordinary working people. Under this government, most people are missing out. Only 37 per cent of the minimal gains have been accruing to working New Zealanders. And that is, lays bare, uh, a fundamental approach to the economy, which is just not interested in the interests of most New Zealanders. And in these supplementary estimates, I flick through because I, I, um, I enjoy looking through these things. It's a, a slightly uh, awkward thing to admit to, but enjoy having a flick through. And I was looking through and stumbled across uh, the Inland Revenue um, uh, supplementary estimates and remembered, of course, that the business transformation project, uh, the grandly titled uh, computer rebuild at the IRD, was one of the, the big infrastructure projects claimed by this government as part of its budget. Infrastructure project being a central government computer, uh, Mr Speaker. That's the great vision. That's the great vision. Big replacing hit. what we already have. Replacing what we already have. That's the big hit, as Mr Cosgrove says. Uh, that is the vision. And so in the estimates here, the supplementary estimates, we find a line that says a transfer of $717,000 from the year 2014-15 to 2015-16 for restructuring costs. That's, that's, that's the grand vision that we find in the supplementary estimates. We, and then we find something about this rebuild, a fiscally neutral adjustment, Mr Speaker, a fiscally neutral adjustment uh, of 2.0. 100 uh, zero, zero million to reflect 
Inland Revenue's funding contribution to the Business Transformation Programme. This is, Mr Speaker, the kind of thing we find in this document. It is moving small amounts around in a fiscally neutral fashion. Uh, if you're lucky, a transfer here, a fiscally neutral adjustment there. That is the range of exciting uh, uh, plans on show from the government in the supplementary estimates. And so, Mr Speaker, um, what else do we notice if we look through this document further? What we find in there is that there are delays. There are delays noted in here. The reason that the government has a little bit more money in its pocket to spend uh, on some issues is because they haven't got round to spending it last year. So the Christchurch rebuild delays contribute uh, to the changes in this, in this document. We find that the slow rollout of broadband contributes to some of the change that have to be noted in this document. We find also that uh, some outstanding earthquake claims uh, that have been written off because the government hasn't managed the process well are in this document. We also find that there's a reduction in capital expenditure for DHBs, cap capital expenditure. And at the very time when we know that the southern DHB needs a $300 million refit of the clinical services building that sits in Dunedin Hospital. We know that that needs to happen. We know a rebuild needs to happen. This government keeps pushing out the expenditure year after year after year. Tony Ryle was going to bring a plan to this House to rebuild uh, the, Christ, the Dunedin Hospital, and uh, he's gone. He's gone. Then arrived Minister Coleman. He said, ah, I will commit to that. I will have it done uh, just as Mr Ryle suggested. Then he shifted it out. And then finally he shifted it to the end of the year, and now he's shifted it to a bunch of commissioners who have no fixed deadline, uh, as best I can tell, for delivering a capital rebuild project to the Cabinet. They keep pushing it out. So in here we find uh, more adjustments because they haven't spent their capital allocation. So here we are. Here's the kind of jiggery-pokery that's in here. It's about a government that isn't doing what it says it will do. It has a limited vision for what it will do, and even then it is not delivering on it. That is what these supplementary estimates tell us when we actually look through them, Mr Speaker. We can also see uh, that there is $50 million put aside because unemployment uh, beneficiaries are higher than forecast. So in these documents, we have an extra $55 million allocated for a higher number of unemployment beneficiaries. Speaks to the government's success once again. It's an economy that is working in the interests of the ultra-wealthy and middle New Zealand is missing out. Those who are struggling, those who hit hard times, middle New Zealand is missing out in this budget and in these documents for the supplementary estimates. We also find in there a reduction in the programme for investing in education success. Um, and, and what more would you expect from this government? We also find that the forecast uh, tax credit for KiwiSaver is down because people are earning less and therefore the KiwiSaver contributions uh, are less overall because forecast wage growth simply has not eventuated. This is a government overseeing a stagnant economy and content to manage decline. Mr Speaker, they are content to manage decline. That seems to be the vision that we find in this document here. And I look forward uh, to some more contributions from those opposite to explain uh, how exciting managing decline can be. I mean, that may well be what we hear from the next speaker. I, I think it's Mr Bishop. I can see him poised, uh, sitting on the edge of his seat there, ready to tell us that actually managed decline is one term for it, but there's a much more exciting term, uh, which is about managing the economy well or some such uh, uh, story. Um, because uh, they do not have an answer to the fact that GDP per capita has been absolutely flat. The fact that New Zealanders, most New Zealanders have not seen salary or wage increases, that most New Zealanders are missing out, that the share of wealth going to the top 10% of New Zealanders is now at 60% uh, in the recent study that came out, that we have growing inequalities, that home ownership is the lowest it's been since 1951, that they've underfunded the health system by $1.7 billion in the last six years, that they've capped operational spending on education. This is a government with no vision but to manage decline. They're not interested in the Kiwi dream, like we here over here in the Labor Party are interested in. We would have made sure that 100,000 new houses were planned for. We would have made sure that the health and education systems were properly funded. But this is the government's document. This is the national government's document. They are content to manage decline. Shame on them. Uh, this is not what New Zealand deserves. Mr Speaker. I call Chris 